What? What do you mean? You don't think they can see me? Why? Oh, because I have camouflage on. Oh, you don't think they can see me because I have camouflage on. Well, hey, we're rolling right now. So, uh, hey everybody, welcome to The Gathering Place. Uh, my name is Daniel. I am here. Don't let the camouflage uh, confuse you. It's good to be with you today. I'm sitting at a table just like we do on Sunday mornings at The Gathering Place. And uh, I've got my candy here, just like we have at The Gathering Place. Because sometimes when the preacher goes long, you just need a little bit of sugar. And so that's how we do it here. We like to sit around tables. We sit in rows. We sit uh, together. We sit apart. We do whatever uh, we can do to be together right now in this crazy time, but God is good to us and he's showing up in a big way. Hey, I want to uh, take a moment to walk through the scripture with you today. Uh, some people have asked after my last message when I was talking, I, I said, I don't feel like we are at a point where we are having to take a stand against the government. This isn't a fight against the government. Uh, as a church, we're to be focused in on the things of God. And then uh, some people wonder, well, what, what do you mean by that? And, and at what point does the government overstep? Well, that's probably a message for another time. But I do want to show you from the scripture uh, how we see a progression of the church coming under pressure from the governing authorities. And you see it in, in chapter uh, 4. It starts off in chapter 4 of the book of Acts. And I want to read some of this to you because I think you're going to see something that will open up your eyes and give you an ability to watch, you know, give you an idea of what are the signs that we need to watch for. Uh, but let me just tell you this. I'm, I'm not someone who is feels like we're always in a fight with the government. I don't feel like we have to be alarmed that way. I think we really need to be focused on what is God saying and be about his business. And that's why I'm directing you to the scripture and not what is going on in the news. We will talk a little bit about that, but that's not the biggest thing happening. That's not our guiding uh, light there as far as what's coming up through the media. In Acts chapter 4, let's look at this right here. It says, um, there is a story where, where in this story, Peter and, and some of the other apostles, they had been preaching and th there was a miracle that took place. And as a result of that, more and more people started to gather. And those who were the uh, religious leaders, but they had authority over Jerusalem, Rome, Rome ruled the, 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 um, the area. Rome was the federal government, so to speak. But they appointed the local leaders, even the Jewish leaders, to kind of maintain control. They weren't ultimately in control because Rome still was. However, they had a lot of influence and a lot of uh, ability to control their own people, so to speak. So they, they governed them. And when Peter and some of the other apostles were out preaching about Jesus and really speaking to the crowd, they started to get nervous. The, the governing officials started to get nervous because people were going to, at, uh, they were going to turn more and more towards this Jesus that Peter was preaching. And so in Acts chapter 4, verse 16, they all come together and they say, For what shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no one in this name. So the very first thing they did when the church started to grow and they were getting together and uh, they were really get, uh, gaining momentum is the religious leaders came out and they threatened them. And they just told them, from now on, they commanded them, do not speak in the name of Jesus. Do not uh, go out there and preach the name of Jesus. Don't gather to preach in the name of Jesus. They gave them an order that you're no longer to have church. <laughs> and so this is a scripture that you might be familiar with in verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And so uh, Peter and John, they just basically said, hey, it's, you guys go ahead and decide among yourselves you know, what you think we should do. But on our part, we're going to do it. <laughs> we're going to speak the truth. We're going to speak about Jesus. This has been our experience. 
We have seen him with our eyes. We've touched him with our hands. He's transformed our hearts and our lives. And um, we're going to go and make sure that we tell everybody about it. And so they did. They continued to preach. They continued to pray for boldness. They continued to go around and, and see lives changed. And then we get to Acts chapter 5. And you see a progression of pressure that the government puts on the church. In Acts chapter 5, it says that a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, and they were bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So people who were sick and who were tormented in their, in their minds, in their emotions, in their heart, um, by unclean spirits, demonic spirits, the enemy that was tearing these people apart, they were coming to church, they were coming to the apostles, they were gathering together. It didn't look like our church looks like today, by the way. They didn't have all these church buildings everywhere. They met in houses and they met at the, the local temple and they met anywhere outside that they could. Uh, but as they came together, though they were commanded not to, they were being healed. And verse 17 says, Then the high priest rose up and those who were with him which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. They were ticked off. They were mad. These guys were screaming like crazy. They looked like, you know, they, they were about to lose their mind because people were getting healed. These guys were out, you know, besides themselves because people were, were being set free. Isn't that crazy? But that's how it was. It's how it is sometimes today, too. You know, we hear about things where, you, uh, you know, something good happens or you hear about what is right and there are people who are flipping out saying that's wrong. <laughs> it's just the world we live in and it's always been that way. Verse 18 says, they laid their hands on the apostles and they put them in the common prison. And so first they were ordered not to meet and not to preach. Don't speak in the name of Jesus. And when they continued to speak, then they, they were even angrier and so they came and they locked them up. So the second step was they got arrested. They were thrown in jail. You see, whenever you do what God's calling you to do, we know that there's benefits to that. We know that there's fruit to that. We know that good things can come out of that. But you also got to understand that sometimes there's negative consequences to you. And uh, none of us like those. None of us want that. But sometimes that happens and it's terrible. The enemy doesn't like when the church gathers. It doesn't stop there. In the book of Acts, we see this resistance continue to progress against the church. And you get to Acts chapter 5, verse 27. And it says, when they had brought them down, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, did we not strictly, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? By the way, in the county we live in, I heard that some are trying to pass. It might have even gone to the, to the, the council or the commission. I don't know which, which governing authority. But they, they went from commanding, you know, giving an order for restaurants and, and gyms and churches to close to now they're saying, we have to give it some teeth. And so we need to find them when they are operating. We need to find people for meeting and violating our strict command not to gather. So this is, this is not new to us. This is the life and history of the church. So we get back here and we see it in, we see it in this next verse. It says that, uh, they said, we, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this man's name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine or with your teaching. And you intend to bring this man's blood on us. So everyone's going to be angry at us if you keep preaching Jesus. But Peter and the others answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. You know, there are times in our lives when we have to just look at whoever is telling us to stop and say, we ought to obey God rather than men. So it's a choice that we have to make. Now, when we read about the choice, it's easy to agree with that. But when you're faced with the choice personally in your own life for your business, for your church, for your family, it's easy to compromise or back down. We choose comfort over sacrifice 
because we don't want to lose our safety and security. However, when we do that, we lose it all. And so the apostles, they knew we've got to obey God at any cost to ourselves. It doesn't stop there. Peter actually goes on to preach and he tells them this. He says, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we're his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey them, obey him. And so he, there, he's sitting here and he's saying, you know, Jesus, he went to the cross for you. He went to the cross for me. And he slips it in there. He keeps preaching. He keeps the focus where the focus needs to be. The focus isn't on the government. The focus isn't on their laws. The focus isn't on our rights. The focus is on Jesus and who he is and what he's done. Everything else is irrelevant compared to that. Nothing is more important than that. So this is what happens. In verse 40, it says that they all got together and they began speaking the council. And it said this, that they had called for the apostles and they beat them and they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and then they let them go. So it went from commanding to arresting to beating them. You see the progression there? Now, I think in the United States, where we're at, for the most part, we don't operate that way. But sometimes it happens. I pray to God that it never happens to you or to me. But it happened to them. It may not look exactly the same in every situation, but there's always a progression. And look at what happens. The disciples, in verse 41, it says, they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And then you know what they did? They didn't put a closed sign on the church. Daily and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So they didn't back down and they did it wherever they could, however they could, whenever they could. They didn't stop preaching Jesus. This is the message they were preaching. By the way, I want to get back to this because though I'm not talking politics, I think that a big challenge for us Christians is to pivot from talking politics to talking Jesus. Do you know what I'm saying? When, when, we're, when we're communicating about what's going on, if we're so focused on politics that we undermine our ability to speak about Jesus because we took such a strong stand on a political issue or a politician, not realizing that they're not our savior. Now, I know most people would say that. They're not our savior. We get it. And these things, we need to take a stand for righteousness. I get that. But have a passion for Jesus. <laughs> have even a greater passion for salvation. Things that matter even more for eternity. Think about that. So they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Uh, I wish that I could say that's as bad as it got. But as you continue to read, and this is all within a few short uh, years, a time period in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 7, they, they arrested another one of the uh, disciples. His name was Stephen. And they brought up these false accusations against him because God was using him. And he had a lot of influence. And look at verse 54 of Acts chapter 7. It says, uh, after Stephen had preached the word to them, it said, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. So in other words, he was on trial. And when he went to trial, he just simply let uh, the Spirit of God lead him in what he said. And when he went to trial, uh, he spoke. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. The council was. And they gnashed at him with their teeth. They were angry at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. You know what's interesting about that is 
Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. All the other references to Jesus in heaven, he's seated at the right hand of God. But it's almost as if, as if when Stephen is on, on the stand there and he's giving testimony, he's witnessing to who Jesus is before all these unbelievers, Jesus stands up. He stands up. He get, he, you know, I got to stand in the camera here. But he gets out of his seat. And it's like he's leaning in. He's saying, oh, that's my boy right there. That, that's my Stephen right there. Look at him preaching with boldness, not afraid to lose his own life, not afraid of what other people will think about him. Jesus got out of his seat to watch and to, to, to witness to Stephen laying his life down for Jesus in a very similar way that Jesus laid his life down for Stephen. Think about that for a second. Think about how, how, uh, how, how we as believers have received so much, so much from Jesus. And are we willing to, to give it back? You know, sometimes uh, we, we, we say we would, we would die for Jesus, right? You hear people say, I'll, I'll die for Jesus. Man, if someone put a, a gun to my head right now and said, deny Jesus, or, or I'm going to kill you. I would let him kill me. We say I'd die for him. But are you willing to live for him? Am I willing to live for him? That's what we've got to think about right there. Jesus stood up and he's standing at the right hand of God. And it just drove everybody crazy. In verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears and they ran at him with one accord. They cast him out of the, st- the city and they, they stoned him. They killed him with rocks. They took the large boulders and they were smashing them with it. This is the price that he paid. But on his way down, verse 60 or verse 59, it says, When they stoned Stephen as as he was calling on God and he was saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep or he died. So, G, so, so Stephen was the real deal. Stephen was the real deal. When he was even being killed by these guys, he was looking to Jesus to forgive them. You see, his heart wasn't to see these, these wicked rulers destroyed. His heart was to see him saved. He knew who Jesus was and what he had, he had done and he, and he knew that Jesus' blood was shed for these wicked rulers, for the very ones who were throwing rocks at him and about to kill him. And he did the same thing that Jesus did when he went to the cross. When Jesus is on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. And this is the heart of Jesus. And I think that's why Jesus stood up to, you know, to really look and see and watch Stephen lay his life down, and he he took note of that. Well, this progression continues, and you see it in Acts chapter 12, Herod. Now, he was one of the the appointed rulers from the Romans. In verse 1, it says, Now about the time that Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church, then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So James and John, those early apostles and disciples, He came and he killed James, who was one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. And because he saw that his poll numbers went up when he came against the church. Oh, I'm sorry. It doesn't say it like that. It says, and because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. And uh, he was going to try to kill him. He locked him up, but constant prayer was offered for Peter by the church. We need to be praying for those who take a stand right now. I know that uh, everybody has, every church, every, every business, every family, you know, every business owner, you all have to make a decision based on your conscience and how you feel like the Lord is leading you. And so some have had to navigate one way or another, and uh, I don't fault anybody for that. We didn't open here for quite a while, though we were allowed to, and it wasn't because uh a fear. It was because we're starting over. We need to make sure that we're right in a line with what God is saying for us. And everybody's in a unique situation. Uh, but you ought to obey God rather than men. So whatever God is telling you to do, find it from the scripture 
and then process it in your context. Pray and talk with some, some godly, godly leaders. Um, here's what I want to say about all what I just read. We see a progression. We see a threat. We see an arrest. We see a beating. We see, see a killing. You see how uh, when the church doesn't stop and give in, it doesn't mean that the government or the opposition stops. Sometimes it increases. But here's the deal, and this is so important, I think we've got to catch this, is that in the midst of that, what God was doing was far more impactful than what the government was doing. The, the expansion of the kingdom of God, the plan of God, far outpaced the clampdown or the lockdown from the government. You see, if you couldn't stop the church when it was only one man on the cross, then you're not going to stop it when it's over a billion people worldwide. For us, we know that there's opposition, but We've got to read between the lines of what I just read. What do I mean by that? I read to you the points of opposition and persecution and arrests and beatings and, and the, uh, the murder, uh, the state-sanctioned murder of God's people. But between the lines there, what you, what you do see is the church expanding and preaching the gospel and being about their father's business. What you won't see is the church making a big deal about what the government is doing. The church, you don't see them going around and making that their focus. You don't see the people of God so focused on the rights and wrongs of the government. What you see them focused on is Jesus and making a big deal over, of how he has righted our wrongs. And as we keep that as our focus, now I understand it's, good, it's interesting and entertaining to talk about what's happening politically right now. But when we make the big deal about Jesus, we can't be stopped. And not only can we not be stopped, but God does supernatural things that we couldn't do on our own. So we're not just a, a, a weak, you know, we don't just rely on the weakness of political power. We rely on the strength of God when we put him for first and we magnify or we make the big deal Jesus. The big deal isn't COVID. The big deal isn't the election. The big deal isn't the lockdown. The big deal isn't the governing, government control. The big deal is Jesus. All that other stuff is temporary. Every one of us will stand before the Lord one day and will give an account. And the only way to be accepted and approved by God is not based on our political affiliation or the stand for doing good that we ha had on earth, but it'll be, did we embrace Jesus Christ, the one and only Son of God, our Lord and Savior, who died for us on the cross, paid for our sins, did we receive his forgiveness? That's what counts. And when we read between the lines, we see that these guys were going and they were being more and more emboldened to speak the truth and speak their faith and spread it. And that's something that I think is a challenge for us. We, we need to make sure that we are, we are focused on what the big deal is. Now, the government made a big deal about the church, but they couldn't stop them. And he won't, they won't be able to stop us. I do want to say something that, that um, concerns me. Where we're at as a culture, I heard, and, and somebody, 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 tell me that I'm wrong. Tell me that I'm wrong. I mean, really, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I didn't hear this. But I heard that, that some jurisdictions, some states, some counties, some, some, some areas, they, they have created hotlines so that you can report on other businesses and neighbors who are either having too many people over. For example, just in your, your neighborhood, if, if you see your neighbors having uh, large groups of people, that you can actually anonymously report them, turn them in. Is this Russia? Is this communist China? 
Are we, you know, where, where is the, where is the, the, the wall that, that separates us and holds us back and, you know, that, the free people from the, the communist nations? Where, is that the KGB? Like, I'm hoping it's not true. I'm hoping that it's one of these internet conspiracies that want to make us uh, afraid or angry. But if it's true, tell me it's not true. I don't want it to be true. But if that's true, that's, that's terrible. But what it makes me think of, okay, first of all, don't give place to that and speak against that stuff. If it's happening, speak against it. Call your whoever, your mayor, your senator, your governor. Call somebody. Call, tell, tell people, that's wrong. <laughs> We're not going to do that. We're not going to uh, tur- turn on one another. If you have concerns with your neighbor, go talk to your neighbor. Or keep your distance and, and hunker down. But look at this. This is, this is what it makes me think of from Scripture. we gotta, we got to process things through the Scripture as followers of Christ. So Jesus talked about this um, in the last days in Matthew 24. He said, verse 10, Many will be offended and they will betray one another. And they will hate one another. Then many false prophets will arise and they'll deceive many. I think about that because I think false prophets, we think they're just going to come and preach and act like they're doing the miracles and stuff. You know, a false prophet could come and say, yeah, I'm, I'm religiously affiliated with the church and they can, be, they can deceive many people by getting their focus on natural things, getting their focus off of Jesus, getting their focus on fear, getting their focus on some of these social issues and going about them going about them in an ungodly way. And they can do it and say they're part of the church. I love this every, every time that anyone's trying to get the, get the Christian vote, that they always emphasize their Christian upbringing. They, all, they always try to say, yeah, I'm a good Christian, I'm a good Catholic, I'm a good this or that, or this person went to church. Come on, man. We know what the scripture says. It says many false prophets will arise to deceive many. These aren't just going to be the sensational um, televangelists the f- or the fake miracle workers that, you know, get exposed. These are going to be some very respectable, vote-worthy people. Verse 12, and because lawlessness will abound, look at that, because lawlessness will abound. If you, if you do look at what's been going on in our nation, that people could destroy businesses, that we can destroy one another, that we can um, attack police, that we can attack each other, we can burn down buildings, lawlessness, and, and the authorities are told to stand back, and there's such a, a boldness to violate the laws, sometimes because there's, there's an issue of injustice that preceded this, but for many of those who are actually engaging that has nothing to do with injustice. It has everything to do with lawlessness. And the Bible says in the last days, God is telling us lawlessness will abound. Now, let me, let me just say this. I'm not I'm not sitting here trying to thump the Bible at anyone and say, look at all these people. I'm just saying, look at, look at what's going on around us in light of what the scripture says. And as you do, you're going you're gonna, to uh, have a lot of insight in how to operate. But he said, because lawlessness abounds, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. I want you to think about that right there. Is it possible that this is what sets the stage for this coming end that Jesus talked about? It's these little things. For example, in Matthew 10, verse 21, brother will betray brother to death and a father his child, and children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You'll be hated by everyone because of me. 
but he who st stands firm to the end shall be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, go to another. Truly I tell you, you won't finish going through all the towns before the Son of Man comes. Jesus is talking about the end times, and he says, it will be at a point where we have, our hearts have grown so cold that one person is turning against another, neighbor against neighbor, but it, it progresses to brother against brother, father against child, children against parents, all the way to the point of putting them to death. Now, I know that sounds extreme, and you're right, it is. But how do we get to extreme places? We have been there before. How do we get to these extreme places? Is it possible that it comes by something as simple as a prompt that is guised as keep your neighborhood safe? So if somebody is violating our orders, would you go ahead and turn them in for us? Now, right as of now, there's probably not a reward for that. But wait till they start to put a, um, a hotline that has a reward associated with it for turning in those who are gathering together with their family and friends and neighbors, not to violate any um, major law or real law. It's just these orders of the government that says, you shall not gather. Think about that for just a moment. How did we give up so much of our freedom as a nation? It's ridiculous. But understand, this is the direction it's going. And I'm not saying that we have to keep the train going down the tracks. I'm also not saying we've got to stop that and we can. I don't know. I know eventually we will get to the point where father will betray his child, parents and kids will be at such animosity to where they'll betray each other to death. And um, for the Christians, you'll be hated by everybody for Jesus' name because that's what he says. But if you stand firm, the end will come. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you stand firm, you will be saved when the end comes is what I mean to say. So here, let me, let me just wrap this up. What are we to do? Okay, we, we said that there's a progression, but we said that our main focus needs to be, we've got to preach Jesus. We've got to stay focused on Jesus and make him the big deal. What, are we, what do we need to do? Uh, you need to be grounded in God's word like never before. Pressing in. Don't just listen to, to news. Uh, listen to the word. Read the word for yourself. And read it for yourself, not for what you see going on. God will speak to you about what's going on when you read it for yourself. Second, Hold fast to what you believe because it will be tested. You can say, I believe this with my whole heart and no one could ever sway me. I'm telling you, when you get in certain situations where there's temptation to cave, you find out what you really believe. So you got to hold on to it um, strong with everything you got. Also, we've got to lock arms with other believers. We've got to have like-minded people that we are leaning into and uh, gathering with on a regular basis and saying, hey, I got your back. Do you have mine? And know what's going on in their life. Be praying for them and walking them through those situations. Fourth thing is uh, pray, be bold. Pray for boldness and be bold. These are the times that we will see Jesus show up like never before. And so uh, don't back down and don't think that no one wants to hear. People are hungry for a transformation from a real God. And his name is Jesus. He will use you. He's put you on this earth for such a time as this. I love you. Julia and I love you. The Gathering Place loves you. We hope that uh, if you are local, that you'll be connected. If we can come into your home via video, we'll do it. If you can come into our church, uh, do it. Whatever it takes to continue to grow and be strengthened, let's just be committed. We'll navigate the season that we're in, and we're going to see God show up and do powerful things in all of our lives. If you're able to make it on Sunday mornings at 930, join us at the gathering place here in Folsom. If you're out of our area, go to your church or get online or do whatever you need to do. Go to your neighbor's house. Uh, but if what, what, no matter what takes place, make sure that you're pressing into your relationship with Jesus. Live out your faith more than Sunday 
We love you. God bless you.